each of us is part of a great chain of peace builders and it's gone on since time immemorial. There have always been people working for peace, standing up for justice. And it's our turn now, and then we pass it on to the next generation. I was raised in a neighborhood that was full of people from um, immigrant populations all over the world, um, with a lot of consciousness about racial disparities and economic disparities. But to tell you the truth, as a girl and young woman coming up in those days, I had to fight for every scrap of it. And when my children were young, the women's movement started. And my life opened up in dimensions I never could have dreamed. So I credit the women's movement for giving me the courage to find out who I was and what I was meant to do in this world. And I worked in New Jersey and New York City around issues of race. So I learned about facilitation in those days. I had never done that before. And we were sent around to work with um, school systems and police systems and hospital systems. And it was the days of integration to try to get people across these, these um, divisions around race and ethnicity. And then when I moved to New England, I did some work as a therapist. With three other women from the region, I started a feminist therapy collective. I seem to have startup energy. I got involved in Buddhism, completely unexpected. I wrote my dissertation on the relationship between psychotherapy and Buddhist meditation. It was for me another way to reach my own mind and to deepen my understanding of human phenomenon and what it means to be a person living and breathing on this earth. I started Karuna Center for Peace Building in 1994. Karuna means compassion. It comes from the ancient languages of India, from Sanskrit and Pali. From the beginning of Karuna Center, it was clear that our work was going to be about bridging divides. Our first large assignment was post-war Bosnia. And the invitation came from a woman who had become a victim in the war. So on our first trip there in 1997, I believe it was, um, we did women's circles and it was heartbreaking because the women would go around the, the circle, not the room, because we were outside in a refugee camp. They'd go around the circle and introduce themselves and say, I lost my husband. I lost my husband and my son. I lost my father and my brother. I lost two sons, just endless. And they wept, they just wept. And that's what was needed at that time was to weep together. And we continued to dialogue. And after doing this for a year or two, which meant several trips, they said, Paula, we'd like to talk to the Serb women. And I thought, that's pretty far out. Those were the, the enemies. Then they said, after two or three years of doing it, we want you to work with the educators because we think that if you can do for the school systems what you've done for us, Bosnia has a future. And I've been back, and um, one of the people that I trained has opened his own NGO, which he calls the Center for Peace Building, and it's the next generation carrying on the work. Well, I remember one of the first sentences that you said was, either you deal with this, and what happened to you, or you will have your children and grandchildren. You will put them in position to deal with these things. And I just felt it's not fair that we would uh, transfer our traumas and our mm -hmm. hate and our anger towards uh, on, on the next generation to come. But it was really up to us to start healing right away. I learned that people were not divided. People have been divided. People have been divided for the spoils of war and for the spoils of power. And these people didn't hate each other. They were taught to hate each other. They didn't want to kill each other. They were related to each other. They were all intermarried and interwoven in cities that functioned for them, but they became divided by others. I learned a great deal more about the work I do now from that experience.
because we were dialoguing across divides without my even having that label for it. Um, I worked even before I started Karuna Center in Myanmar, then called Burma, a very divided society, now in big trouble with a, a military, another military coup. We were called early to Rwanda. I was there the year after the 1994 genocide. Israel and Palestine is divided even with the naming. Um, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Macedonia, Kosovo, Armenia and Azerbaijan, South Sudan and Sudan, India, Pakistan, it just, the list goes on and on. And it's all about divides. But there are some people every place who have just the little edge of courage and curiosity. And those are the ones who showed up. And when I work in, in war zones overseas, I'm astounded by who shows up. But there's always in every community, there are people who are curious about the other side and who want to mend fences and build bridges and share what's happened to them and learn more. Program I started at SIT in 1997. It's called Conflict Transformation Across Cultures. And my goal was to bring people from war zones together to campus for a long intensive three weeks as it turned out to meet each other. And they came from every religion, every ethnic group, every sh color, shade of skin that possibly existed all over the world. Um, and the harmony in that room when people took away their defenses and sat with each other in our common plight, I think was moved me more profoundly than anything else because it was like a little United Nations. There were often 60 or 70 people in the room and they were battered and bruised and war torn and traumatized and they found each other and built a community. And I can't imagine anything more beautiful. Paula is not only our mentor, but I think she's a global mentor for uh, developing a, a community of peace builders around the globe. So she is not only a pioneer, but also like, you know, a mentor to hundreds and thousands of the uh, peace builders uh, in which she has infused uh, I think uh, this uh, this uh, this sentiments, these feelings that you have to work for global peace. In Rwanda, when they were setting up the genocide, they called the Tutsis who they were killing cockroaches. You can step out a cockroach; it's not a human being. When the U.S. servicemen were, were training to kill in Vietnam, um, they were told that these were not humans, these were gooks. These are words that dehumanize, all the words that African Americans have been called in this country for centuries. It takes it away from the humanness. It's really hard to kill. The army has learned how to teach people how to kill because killing violates everything you've learned since you started kindergarten. Everything about nice and sharing your toys and playing with others and don't hit Johnny on the head with your shovel, all of that that we learn as little children has to be unlearned and relearned in order to kill. And so there are psychological ways that people were taught to kill and one of them is this massive dehumanization. So trying to work with this and make sure that we're not doing this with um, the Mexicans on the other side of the border or the Pakistanis on the other side of the world or anybody else in our own community is really important. Some years ago, my husband and I and a few colleagues had started something called the Leverett Peace Commission. We were opposing one of the endless wars that our country's gotten into. And then the election happened in 2016. We decided to call a meeting in the library just after the election. The town is largely progressive. 85% of the people voted for Hillary. And we wanted to understand what had happened to our country. One of our members spotted an article online written by a guy who was living in Kentucky doing community organizing. And he mentioned the word dialogue in one of his articles. And so my colleague wrote to him when that email from Jay came, he read the article, he sent a cold email. I brought it to 
the people to the, and specifically to the organization called the Letcher County Culture Hub. Seven months later, we were driving up in a van of Penny's Kentuckians and me up to Leverett in October of 2017. And, and the work began in earnest. I wanted to make sure that we began with topics that would bind us to each other. And I decided to talk about families because we've all got them for better and for worse. We all have families and that would give us a common bond. Um, we gave each person a square, like a quilt square of paper and asked each person to depict some family story on it. And we put out lots of crayons and markers and ribbons and tape and all sorts of things. And it was kind of like kindergarten. But then the art also provided the entree into hearing each other's stories. Two of the people in our group had Holocaust stories. Two of them had been born to mothers and fathers who had been in Europe and escaped the Holocaust. And as they told their stories, they cried. How could you not cry when you tell a Holocaust story? And the Kentuckians were just completely flabbergasted. And then they told coal mining stories and some of them cried. And that was as new to us as the Holocaust was to them. After the Holocaust things came out, one of the women said, I've been taught to hate refugees and immigrants, but I've never met one. And now I'm meeting you and you are refugees and immigrants. And if I like you, I guess I have to like them also which is the whole goal of this work, is to get it from the group to the society. I find myself saying, we can't dismiss anybody. We may not agree with the behavior, certainly with the extremist behavior, none of us would condone any of that. It's not about condoning. It's about knowing it's about something. Behavior never arises in a vacuum. I'm a psychologist, I understand that. I used to be a therapist in an earlier chapter of my life. I, I know what this is about and it's there in all of us. And having the empathy and the compassion for others is the way that we take all that we've learned in this dialogue, all the personal transformation, and use it for social transformation and political transformation. So it's it's really it's becoming an upstander. It's standing up for other people who are also being swept away in, in great stereotypes and generalizations. Dialogue by its nature is intimate and small, and in order to grow these concepts and these, these shifts in attitudes and behaviors, we need national and international publicity. It's this human heart that connects us and connects our longing and connects our sense of care for each other everywhere. So I relearned that with this group. Bridge for Unity is the latest project that we're doing on race and racism between Western Massachusetts, Beaufort County, South Carolina, and Letcher County, Kentucky. Each of the three groups was mixed race, and we had a um, three-state race and racism dialogue that was very successful, actually beyond my wildest expectations. It began with a trip to a plantation turned museum um, in Charleston, and that, I think, bonded us very deeply because we were facing the history of enslaved people together. In building the new society, we have to use our imaginations. And we've done some things. The women's movement is probably the biggest case in point for us to think about. But there's food co-ops, sustainable agriculture, restorative justice programs, alternatives to prison, solar and wind farms, negotiation and mediation processes, the Occupy movement, the ethic underneath Standing Rock as a way of resisting, the Black Lives Matter actions, alternative health care, global human rights, 
and institutional developments like the EU and the UN. So we're, we're doing it. We're moving ahead. As we're taking down the old, we're building up the new. We need institutions and safety nets and communities of solidarity that include everyone, absolutely everyone, because anyone who was left out is the next spoiler. So I want to ask you to do an experiment for a minute. Make a circle with your arms and ask yourself, who's in your inner circle? Who's there for you? Parents, children, partners, friends, who's in there? Take a look. Take a look at who's left out of your circle. Who's not there? See if you can open your circle a little bit. Who are you going to put in? Who do you include this time in a little bigger circle? Who's still left out? Who is outside your circle? Can you go bigger? Can you go bigger? Can you imagine a full inclusion? Taking in all the people you were taught to hate and fear. Taking in all the people you have been opposed to. Taking in all the people you don't know, whose values may be different than you know. How wide can you stretch, stretch and respect and compassion? Thank you.